I'd like to call to order the April 28th Class City Council meeting. Would the clerk please call roll? Mayor Edwards? Here. Council members Klein? Here. McCoy? Here. Judkins? Weaver? Here. Michelinani? Here. Thank you. If you'd all rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next, we have uh, approval of the agenda. I know of no changes. Move approval. Second. We have a motion to second approve the agenda. Further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. The agenda is approved. Next item on the agenda is our citizens' presentation. This is the opportunity anyone has to approach the council on an item that is not on the agenda. And uh, while I reinforce our pillars of character, I'll let Pete double check and see if there's anyone online wishing to address us. Thank you, Your Honor, for folks participating online. Best way to get our attention is to use the raise hand function. If you click on the reactions icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen, a separate window will open up where you can then raise your hand. So just as a reminder, Clive supports the pillars of character counts, endeavoring at all times to promote and model the principles of trustworthiness, respect, responsibility, fairness, caring, and citizenship. In conducting our work, we expect that everyone will act in a respectful manner consistent with these principles. Pete, did we have anyone online? No, Your Honor. Do we have anyone here in the chamber? Seeing no one approaching the podium, We'll move on to consent. Move for resolution. Second. Motion. Second. Further discussion? If not, would the council please vote? And would the clerk please post that vote? And that passes by a vote of four to zero. Very good. Now we'll move into our action items. Uh, Liz, we've got some utility rate adjustments. Yes, good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, this is the final consideration for the utility rate ordinances that were incorporated in this fiscal year's budget. Um, as we reiterate, reiterate um, we incorporated the 3% for water utility, 2% for sewer, and 10% for stormwater. We've had no public comment, um, either verbally or written throughout the adoption process. I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have them. Any questions for Liz? Again, we're looking to the third reading on this. I'll move that ordinance number 1115 be considered for the third time, placed upon its passage and adopted. Second. And we have a second. Further discussion? Seeing none, would the council please vote? And would the clerk please post that vote? And that passes by a vote of four to zero. <clears throat> Ordinance number 1115 is declared to have been enacted. Liz? Thank you. I'll move well, that uh, ordinance number 1116 <laughs> be considered for the third time placed upon its passage and adopted. Second. Second on ordinance number 1116. Further discussion? Seeing none, would the council please vote? And would the clerk please post that vote? Yeah, refresh. refresh. That passes by a vote of four to zero. Ordinance number 1116 is declared to have been enacted. That yep. leaves us with one more, 1117. I'll move that ordinance number 1117 be considered for the third time, placed upon its passage and adopted. Second. Motion a second for the discussion. Seeing none, would the council please vote? And then would the clerk please post that vote? Try it. If your voting isn't working, you can use a thumbs up or a thumbs down. <laughs> very good. Thank you very much. That'll move things along. 
And that passes by a vote of four to zero. Ordinance 1117 is declared to have been enacted. Pete, we move on to the Water Resources Master Plan. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, nothing more to report than what we covered last time. There have been no uh, changes that have been sent my way from either staff or from the council. So the document that is in your packet is the document that we also reviewed last council meeting. Questions for Pete? Otherwise, we just need a motion on the resolution. Move a resolution. Second. We have a motion and a second. Further discussion? If not, would the council please vote? And then would the clerk please post that vote? <clears throat> and that resolution passes by a vote of four to zero. Thank you, Your Honor. Matthew, uh, I think you're up here for food trucks. Okay, hey, good evening. Um, about a year ago, I came to you guys asking for some clarification on how you wanted us to handle food trucks operating on vacant properties or properties with vacant buildings. Um, with your guidance, we implemented a policy. That policy has been in place for a year. We've been operating under it loosely, um, seeing how it's been going. Um, to my knowledge, there have been no complaints <coughs> regarding the one food truck that is operating on the vacant property. Um, we feel that we've been successful in implementing it. Um, you let us roll it out with training wheels. Uh, I think we're now ready to just kind of let the policy go and just rely on the ordinance that we have in place. So with that, I would recommend to terminate the policy. Okay. Any questions? Further session, Ted. So I agree with you okay. on that. I guess my question is, do we know like how many other vacant locations there could potentially be this and if there are any potential negative ramifications if one of those were to be used no, that any kind of foresight that we could and that's why we really were pushing for this policy to begin with so that we could put a cap on it if we ran into these problems and we we put a six month or a 12 month. 90 day cap on it or we had a, there was a limit in the policy that said after it was 60 days, 60, 60 days, yeah. Yeah. Um, right. you'd have to cease operations. Right. And this, there are other places where this could take place, but predominantly the one location is really the one ideal spot. Um, there's not a lot of vacant properties kind of hovering around in Clive that would be conducive to this. Or there'd be a lot of traffic and to, to, to get yeah, you customers. Need, you need to be visible. You need to be in a prime location like that one is. Um, so having not put a lot of staff effort into it, it wasn't a burden on staff. It wasn't something that we constantly had to babysit. Um, we were worried that we would get a public outcry of we don't want this in Clive, but there really hasn't been any of that. So I feel mm -hmm. confident that what is taking place has been kind of embraced by Clive. It's been embraced by the council. Um, it'll fall in line with what we're allowing to happen on property that currently has a brick and mortar building. So like the world liquor and tobacco food truck, um, they would basically be abiding by those same regulations. Yeah. And I think it's pretty normalized around the Metro as well. So it's not like it's something that's just here and Clive, Correct. I guess where I was just had some, a little trepidation is, you know, if it's something that's adjacent to residential mm -hmm. where that, where we could have some impact there, something like the 86th Street location, obviously, I don't think we would ever have any problems with. So, yeah, and, and those boundaries are actually defined and spelled right out in our ordinance. Okay. Um, there's so many feet from a residential, and the hours of operation are actually lessened if you're within so many feet of a residential area. So, thank you, Eric. Matthew, one of the typically one of the biggest detractors uh, to a policy like this, the food trucks, are the actual restaurants, the, the brick and mortar restaurants. Have you received any feedback from them or any pushback from them? I have not. Um, and when we actually rolled this ordinance out back in 2017, I did work with them. We put a, a, a survey out to the public, to um, commercial and to the public in general. Uh, there wasn't actually any pushback to it, to my surprise. And that's why I say, I think the general consensus is that the public has kind of embraced this and that we've accepted it. It's part of our community and it's not something that anybody is really complaining about, at least that has ever been elevated to my ears or really to the council that I'm aware of. Thank you. Michael. I, I, I agree with this. Um, and I have the same 
worries as Ted has, you know, what can happen, right? And of course, we can't plug every hole of what can, but that we just all need to stay, uh, keep open to, you know, change and something happens, I would be more likely to, you know, a grandfather, the one existing Zen. But saying that, um, you know, you start getting them in crazy vacant areas and we may have to revisit this uh whether it's too late or not the other thing i thought about was you know it's kind of but that personally i like the food truck on 86 street <laughs> right but um it is strange that you could put a food truck there year round and yet there's no property tax right where there's a brick and mortar to a building there's a building on there and shouldn't there be some type of fee equivalent to square footage or a building like brick and mortar, making that then a property tax, right? Um, you just love raising taxes. I do. I, do. I love <laughs> no sticking problem. it to the small business and children. Um, but <laughs> We're not talking about lemonade stands. Here. Oh, okay. Or, or libraries. All right. But you, you see what I'm saying? And again, it's for later thought. But, you know. Uh, that's the only thing in the past I had ever heard the arguments of from restaurants when this all broke in the metro area yeah. was we're paying property taxes. And it does make sense. You know, the, the landlord there is getting a fee for that, yet not being, you know, charged equivalent. Mm -hmm. So the owner of the land. So. Anyway, food for thought for a later day. Yeah, you can thank the Iowa legislature for eliminating the machinery and equipment property tax because that would have been an angle where you could have actually taxed equipment like a food truck. Um, but couldn't we do a permit equivalent to? You could no, you could do something like that in your ordinance where if it's a, it's a if it's a vacant lot situation, you could have a higher fee uh, for that. But then you had then you get into the nuance of what's the fee actually paying for? Is it paying for staff time? And then are, is it a tax? And then is it allowed under Iowa law? You know, because it's we only can tax what the Iowa legislature allows us to tax. So then you might get run right. into a conflict. The other I, thing I wanted to mention with Matthew too is there is still tools and protections under the ordinance that staff would have. So the um, still the way the ordinance is worded that if there is a vacant lot request, there has administratively an exemption has to be provided, and we can put guardrails around that exemption. Um, you know, conforming with the temporary site plan requirements is what we're doing with this particular one, not necessarily having the time frame on it for seasonal sales, but having those parameters on it is still controlled by the city. So it's not like if we do have a, a scenario that does come up, you know, staff can still put parameters around that particular operation and your tool is always going to be tying it to the permit, so license. the license. So um, as long as they're in compliance with the license, if when the license comes up for renewal and we've been having some issues with the particular, this, this goes for any food truck, but you could do it with a vacant lot one as well. You could use that license process to deny it. They, you know, they can always appeal to, appeal to the council to go through that process. So you still do have tools in place. This policy just gave you more proactive yeah. upfront pieces. You still have tools to use. How you. often do those come up for renewal? Is it it's their annual, every it's April. Annual. And what do they pay? Uh, it's $100. Um, it's 170 if they need a fire inspection. So it's $100 a year. And most of them, we, we look at the fire inspections from other jurisdictions. So if they've had an inspection in Ankeny, we'll accept right. theirs. That's a cross-border cross yeah. type inspection. And if it's certain types of food, if it's fresh food, there's uh, lower fees. For, yeah, it's a $50 annual fee for uh, a sweet corn. It's like produce. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, Shrikant, did you have any questions? Sorry, I couldn't get to the mute button. Uh, no, but I, I will say that, um, you know, uh, Councilman McCoy makes a good point, uh, and, and I concur with that kind of line of thought. And um, yeah, uh, I'll just leave it at that. Okay. okay thank you. Again, what we're looking for is a motion to terminate. So moved. Second. Motion and a second to terminate. Further discussion? And would the council please vote? You're at my speed now. <laughs> and would the clerk please post the vote? And that passes by a vote of four to zero. So we're back to enforcing the ordinance.
All right, Matt, we've got the uh, pay matrix. And so <coughs> Thank you, Your Honor. This is the annual uh, uh, process for the council approving the uh, pay matrix can pay levels for the coming uh, fiscal year for um, non-union staff positions. Um, a little bit different this year when we reviewed it with the personnel committee talking specifically about the pay matrix, and that is uh, kind of a combination pay for performance matrix where it looks at the market, CPI, and then uh, an employee's score on our performance evaluation process to determine their uh, uh, pay increase for the coming year. Within that, there is a, uh, the CPI has some restrictions on it that were put in place, a minimum of 1% and a maximum of 3%. Well, as we were reviewing information and looking at what other cities are doing and looking at what the CPI was last October, 2021, which is our look back that we do for this number, uh, of course, we're in kind of unprecedented inflationary times and the, that CPI rating was over 6% uh, last October and continues to go up. Um, knowing that this is uh, kind of hopefully a once in a generational uh, inflationary environment and seeing that number of our neighboring communities are looking at a minimum 4% or higher across the board adjustment. Um, wanted to, uh, we discussed with the personnel committee um, looking at doing a one-time exception uh, to the cap on the CPI from 3% to 4%. Put it in the packet uh, was information that was provided to the personnel committee on a lot of reasons um, why we were looking at, at that for both the inflationary piece and those neighboring communities. Um, and there is a budget impact, of course, that goes along with this. Um, and those are outlined in the packet as well. Approximately $100,000 impact to the general fund and, and spread across a few other operational funds. We looked at it and knowing the, the price increases that uh, everyone is facing and, and trying to stay competitive with our neighboring communities, we felt this was appropriate. Um, that's why I brought it forward to the personnel committee for the review. They are recommending it to you. Uh, for your consideration as a part of just, again, a one-time exception, hopefully a one-time exception in this scenario. And, and we see um, things stabilize here over the coming year. But uh, that is our recommendation, personnel committee's recommendation, Your Honor, and be happy to have, uh, I know uh, your, the mayor or, or council member Weaver comment at all on our discussion, the personnel committee, but we felt this was important going forward. So I uh, wanted to recommend it to you tonight. Questions? Um, is, is this... Sorry, um, I was just going to add, um, is this something where we need to consider a policy to maybe look at this if this does need to happen again? I know we're hoping it doesn't happen again, but, you know, given that we don't really know how the market's going and the unpredictability of supply chain and all of those things that we are dealing with, um, is that something that we want to consider? And I think uh, definitely, uh, uh, council member, I think one thing that we're in the midst of, or we're just starting and, and we'll be announcing and talking to the staff about it tomorrow morning, the employee appreciation breakfast is this recruitment retention project that we're working on where we brought in a, a consultant team to help us do some market analysis. Also looking at doing some employee surveys and focus groups that there could potentially be some further adjustments that are needed just to the structure of our, our non-union pay compensation system. And so we anticipate that there will be some discussions that we'll need to have over the next year of what that could look like. And I anticipate if, if there is any permanent changes that would be brought forward to this council and discussed and, and, and adopted then. So I think we're in the midst of that. This is basically, this change gets us to that point. And then there'll be further conversations on what that looks like going forward. Yeah, I'd want to be very careful with that. Uh, obviously, we'd have to do it very thoughtfully. We'd spent many years putting this matrix together. Um, and um, I think it's very effective. Obviously, we're, we're living in, in challenging times and we have to adjust to that. And that's why we have recommended this. And I think it's the right recommendation. Um, but I would be very hesitant to um overhaul the matrix or, or or change the structure of it um without a lot of really a lot of discussion first because we, we spent a lot of time putting this together and i should just clarify i i was not suggesting a, a redo of the entire matrix i was thinking something to to kind of put some parameters around when do we consider these sort of uh one-off adjustments michael yeah i i see where you're you're headed there. I, I like keeping it with, I, I, I'm hesitant to put some kind of automatic trigger in a policy mm -hmm. for something where I think that staff can come and say, look what's happening around, or it can be started by one of us um, to say, let's, let's run this. 
because truly we should be able to make that change anytime we need to. Um, so I, I hear what you're saying. It makes it easier if we have some parameters around it, but I think if we leave it open. I prefer to look at this on a year by year basis, depending on what economic uh, and CPI indexes are, and then move forward at that at that point, as opposed to really embracing a, a parameter driven policy that might drive that. I think we need to be flexible on this, and we need to be nimble on this, and uh, I, that that would be my suggestion. Or mid year, right? I mean, sure. it can happen any. It could happen again that we're back here looking for another one percent or two percent. Well, what we're looking for here is a resolution approving this. A motion a resolution. Second. Motion and a second. Further discussion? Seeing none, would the council please vote? And would the clerk please post that vote? That passes by a vote of four to zero. Next, we have a pay request from RDG <coughs> that was pulled out of consent. Move to approve. Second. second. Motion and a second. Further discussion, if not, would the council please vote? And will the clerk please post that vote? And that passes by a vote of four to zero. Next item is flood mitigation. Doug. Doug. But you can also move that down low if that makes it easier for you. That's fine. Good evening. Um, at our last meeting, I, I shared with you a story of, of uh, what a really bad day in Clive is going to look like uh, when a large flood occurs on Walnut Creek. I shared that story and talked a little bit about the impacts to the city's infrastructure. Uh, but more importantly, I talked about uh, the catastrophic impacts that are likely to be realized by Clive property owners, homeowners, business owners. And I'd be happy to circle back to any of those uh, discussions from the previous meeting, uh, answer any questions that you might have had about uh, what we're dealing with in terms of those impacts on University Boulevard. But if we're all comfortable with, with having a clear understanding of why, we're talking about uh, the next iteration of the University Boulevard Flood Mitigation Plan. I'd really like to pivot and um, allow our, our consulting partner, Stantec, to take some time and walk you through how we might be able to go about reducing the severity of those impacts when that bad day does happen on Walnut Creek and University Boulevard. Jared White and Jason, Jason Snyder, are with us tonight uh, virtually. They're the engineers that have been reviewing the hydrology and hydraulics for Walnut Creek. They've evaluated various flood mitigation alternatives uh, that we might be able to explore for reducing the flood risk in the University Boulevard area. Uh, they have gone through and, and evaluated which projects are technically feasible, financially viable, uh, looked at the benefits that are associated with those projects. And they've also, uh, uh, as we've narrowed in on a preferred recommendation, have looked at what is the funding strategy necessary to support that action. And all in all, uh, really what we're trying to do is develop a long-term framework that allows us to get out of the cycle of flood, rebuild, repeat in this neighborhood. And we want to get to a point where the um, property owners, the business owners, the city of Clive really don't have to worry about that bad day in Clive when the flooding shows up here. As I mentioned uh, previously, the recommendation uh, that you'll hear tonight is really about reducing the flood risk principally in their entirety. Uh, the acquisition of property, the removal of flood risk property, our structures is really the only way to fully eliminate the, uh, the risk. And it is, uh, and, and what we are proposing to you is a bold change. It is radically changing over time, the character of this neighborhood. We, we don't take that 
lightly uh, as we bring this recommendation to you. But again, we see this as really the only effective way to resolve the problem. So we'll have plenty of time for questions and follow-up discussions, but uh, at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Jared and, and let him walk you through uh, the draft of the overall flood mitigation plan for, for University Boulevard. Jason, or sorry, Jared. Thank you, Doug. And uh, thank you to the entire council for having us today. Um, as Doug said, I'm Jared White. I'm a senior engineer with Stantec Consulting. Uh, I'm the technical lead for this project, and we're also, uh, we're also joined by Jason Schneider, who's the project manager. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna step you through some slides here. It'll take about 10 to 15 minutes. Um, definitely not trying to exhaust anybody, but just kind of step you through what we looked at, uh, kind of the scope of our effort and where this led as far as um, kind of the recommended approach and funding strategy to uh, address the, the severe flooding issues at, uh, along the University Boulevard area. So um, this is a little bit of a recap of kind of the technical approach that, that, we, um, that we took on for this, for this scope. Uh, we basically um, they'll throw you some uh, some engineering talk for a, for a second, so humor me. But um, we basically took the existing FEMA data, um, their you know the, their existing mapping of the area. Um, we took that and we enhanced the modeling approach to be able to weigh a couple different alternatives uh, to be able to really explore what would work and what wouldn't in this area. Um, we kind of had an idea going into it of what. Um, of where this might be headed in terms of larger scale mitigation needs for the area. Uh, but, you know, we still, we still did this effort to, um, to understand the different modeling dynamics, take a little bit of more detailed look at specifically the University Boulevard area and, and go from there. So there's, uh, we, we gave several public um, presentations of this stuff in more detail that are, you know, that are available to the group, but uh, just broadly that's, that's, um, in general, what we looked at, there's we have plenty of video and modeling, you know, figures and that sort of thing uh, to document this stuff. But um, it, all in all, not to the surprise of anyone, there's there's pretty significant flood risk in this area, and you know, we endeavored to uh, capture that and with our mathematical models and, and that sort of thing. Um, so we looked at, uh, in in addition to the modeling, we looked at essentially proposed. Um, mitigation strategies. We looked at a couple different things here. They're listed up on the screen, but uh, we looked at uh, a couple of structural options. Um, so that's, that's more uh, heavy infrastructure, um, tend to be costlier projects on the whole, but we looked at uh, potential modifications to the railroad bridge there that's at the downstream end of the study. Um, we also looked at a major levee and flood wall, what that would look like, uh, you know, the footprint of it, the feasibility of it. That didn't, that didn't quite excite us, but um, those were kind of the two structural options. And we looked at uh, additional structure specific options. Uh, so that involved uh, either flood proofing. So keeping the buildings there and adding barriers and enhancements to the structures themselves. Um, and then we also looked at where, you know, what we'll talk about in a little bit more detail, uh, the, the acquisition and demolition also known as uh, kind of the buyout strategy. Um, we also kind of looked at a bonus option. Uh, we won't get too much into this, but we, this is available if, if anybody's curious. But we also looked at kind of a bonus alternative of what we could do with land that, that could be acquired through kind of the buyout approach. Um, and basically, uh, we looked at a, a conceptual level uh, stream remeandering and kind of floodplain reconnection project that would provide some additional support for, for buildings that would potentially remain in that option. Um, and just achieve some additional benefit there. So the reason we looked at these options is to just make sure we're kind of headed in the right direction, make sure that you know we, we didn't leave any stones unturned in terms of what we could do to address the flooding issues in this area. Um, this, it, we, we looked at kind of feasibility and cost and likelihood of, of implementation and kind of time frame, a lot of different factors of these different alternatives. Um, and we'll kind of talk you through at least the at least kind of the summary of, of where that led us. So um, up here are kind of the, these are the benefit cost results. So with all of these alternatives, what we did was essentially a preliminary level benefit cost analysis 
that is an analysis needed for any sort of FEMA funding and other uh, federal funding sources to be able to procure um, money for these types of projects. Uh, so this is a requirement for these, and it also just helped us kind of sift through uh, how these compare to each other, you know, kind of apples to apples. What does this really get us for the uh, amount of money that would need that would be needed to um, achieve these different alternatives? So pretty quickly from these results, uh, acquisition became kind of the front runner. Uh, remember that in addition to kind of the straight benefit costs, that's a that's a pretty um, you know it's a mathematical approach to understanding the benefit cost dynamics. But we did also look at, like I said, those additional considerations like feasibility and um, um, and likelihood and, and things like permitting and stuff like that. So for instance, the levy option became kind of unrealistic given the amount of land it would take to build that thing, how long it would take, that sort of thing. So this, this really led us um, and kind of, this helped us uh, kind of confirm the initial approach, which was that we thought this was headed towards kind of a large scale buyout option. Um, but it, it did help to have kind of that backing of the benefit cost analysis and those sort of um, the, the kind of feasibility criteria that we looked at. So Derek, can I jump in before you move on? Absolutely. So I, I understand how you can calculate costs. How are you yeah. quantifying benefits? Okay, so there is a uh, pretty prescriptive feasible process for calculating benefits. What it really captures is avoided damages in the future. So um, FEMA has a, has a whole in-depth analysis for, um, for understanding uh, what the, it, it factors in kind of the probability of the different storm events that are expected. So FEMA's, if, um, FEMA maps out and analyzes, uh, they have like the 10-year, the 50-year, the 100-year, and the 500-year storm. So it factors in that probability of damage and it factors that into damage methodology to understand how much damage would be expected at different probabilities. And it factors that all together in a, uh, in a what's called the FEMA BCA toolkit. And that spits out what the expected benefits of the project are. But in short, it's avoided uh, structural and content and displacement damages in the future, given the Potential understanding. Future costs. Of yes, yeah, future costs. And it's um, the way FEMA looks at it is, uh, you know, your community participates in the NFIP program. The, the way they look at this is it's worth investing federal money into projects that are going to take risk off the books, take risk off the, the national flood insurance program. So that's, that's what those green bars are there. That's, that's what that um, entails. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. And Jared, just, just to follow up on, on that question. So you, I think you mentioned that it's a it's it's some sort of cost averaging or something like that with the different potential storm levels. Is that right? Yeah. Um, does does that weight the the fact that the hundred year is not going to happen as often as as you know some of the others? Yeah, exactly. So it, it um, not to not to get too much into you know high school calculus, but yeah, it factors in the you know the hundred year, for instance, gets weighted towards that one percent annual chance probability. So it maps out the expected damages um, at different probabilities. So it's kind of this hyperbolic curve uh, that captures fairly low damages for the um, for the more frequent storms that happen every you know one to five years, that sort of thing, and then the severe damages that are incurred for the the hundred year and the five hundred year and that sort of thing. Okay, thank you, and I appreciate you keeping high school calculus out. Yeah, <laughs> trying to keep everyone awake. Um, Okay, so any, any more uh, questions before we move on to talking about the buyout program? Okay, so that, that led us, uh, like I said, given, given kind of the, BC, the uh, preliminary BCA results and um, the feasibility considerations, that led us to the buyout program. So um, this, uh, in, in case anyone's unfamiliar, I think, I think you all are, but basically what that entails is uh, if, if we're talking about leveraging federal funds, that basically means um, paying for the acquisition and the demolition of the buildings uh, in question, and then putting a deed restriction on the property. So um, that means there's restrictions to what can be built on that property. You obviously can't tear this down and build um, you know, a similar structure in its place. There's, there's restrictions on what can be done with that land. Um, as Doug said, this uh, one of the definite perks to this approach is 
in FEMA's eyes and just in general, this is one of the few, if not the only option that truly removes flood risk because it's essentially removing the property, removing the source of risk. So uh, that is that is definitely desirable um, from a few different perspectives. It's, uh, you know, it's not leaving over risk that still needs to be managed. Like for instance, in the case of flood proofing buildings, um, those things like that are only designed to a certain level. So this, this, uh, um, this achieves that kind of peace of mind that we're, you know, that you're going for in terms of, okay, this truly doesn't have to be worried about, at least for those buildings, um, kind of with the highest risk and with the, um, the highest priority of, of getting acquired and that sort of thing. Um, so uh, I mentioned the deed restriction, but also, uh, but there are still options for what you can do with the land um, after afterwards. So that, that, that kind of opens up the um, opens the door for green space and park space and that sort of thing. It's obviously desirable given the proximity of the green belt to um, keep that in mind and consider that as we look down the road to what could be done kind of post acquisition and post buyout approach. Um, and then just just so we're all just so we're all clear, it's uh, the, the cost that we look at for this and the basically what it would entail is um, we look at what would, we basically made an estimate of what the fair market value is of, of these homes. And then we include an allowance for um, all the legal fees, things like appraisal, uh, an allowance for asbestos removal, which may or, not, may or may not be the case. Um, and then of course the, the demolition and any sort of site grading and restoration to get it to that green space or whatever we're talking about. So uh, here's just a map of some of the BCA results. You don't have to, you don't have to, you know, spend too much time looking at this. But the takeaway is we've run these, uh, we've essentially run these calcs for uh, each individual building. Um, we're able to do that using uh, things like GIS and obviously using the the FEMA toolkit that I mentioned earlier. Um, so we have results for these buildings individually, and that allows us to kind of slice and dice this. Uh, and and kind of look at different options in terms of grouping the different buildings. Um, it's just, we we have all this data behind the scenes, uh, and you know all, all that stuff is kind of what we looked at and what could be looked at as as we kind of round out these um, these actual approaches here. So that kind of takes us to the uh, funding options and approach. I'll, I'll pause again if anyone else has uh, questions or wants to chime in on anything. Just real quick, um, going back to that last slide, um, you know, there are some houses in yellow, some in red, some in green, but they, some of them do have, like I'm looking at the lower right hand corner there, you know, even though it's listed as green, it looks like there's still some water potential there. Um, again, avoiding any in-depth in the weeds discussion, can you just give us a little bit of insight into how that determination was made to exclude those or include others? Yeah, so uh, this was heavily informed with uh, a lot of conversations with Doug over the last few months. Um, so that also kind of took into account likelihood of um, likelihood of the property owners participating in this program. I don't think I mentioned that, but um, any sort of federal buyout program, it's completely voluntary. So it requires the buy-in from you know the individual property owners. So this, the border we looked at and we, we kind of started with um, and, and adjusted it from there, uh, took some of that already into account. Yes, there is still flood risk for some of the buildings we're not talking about um, acquiring in this approach, but that, that's, you know, it's, um, I can let maybe Doug speak to that a little bit more, but the, there's other factors that we have to take into account here. We can't just, um, you know, we, we can't just draw the border based on exactly where we identify the flood risk because of that voluntary component. Certainly the uh, conversations that we've had um, both historically with the property owners and, and more specifically uh, as we've worked through this planning process, uh, their involvement, their level of interest certainly goes into the consideration of how we move forward with this proposed plan. The other aspects that um, uh, we have been working on to, to kind of inform this is there are certainly some properties that um, again had no benefit of the floodplain maps or regulations so so they're just significantly impacted four five six seven feet of water is going to inundate those buildings 
there are no other alternatives. It was, it was issues around substantial damage that we talked about. Uh, other buildings along the periphery uh, may have some flood impacts, maybe a foot, uh, something along those lines, but those people will be able to um, resolve or correct or, or manage and mitigate uh, those risks either through flood insurance or they may be able to utilize some type of flood proofing or, or flood uh, mitigation uh, apparatus or device on their properties. So, you know, although, you know, if we had uh, an unlimited pool of money to be able to take care of all of the flood risk in this entire area, um, we would certainly do that. But uh, the reality is that, that we're not going to have that level of funding and our focus is on primarily those that are most in need uh, and then uh, secondarily um, looking at those areas that might be able to um, manage their risk either currently or uh, because of the way that the property is situated, they may be able to redevelop their property. Um, so those are older buildings. Once they pass their useful life, they could grade the property make some adjustments and put up something new. Um, certainly from our perspective, we don't want to um, reduce or, or minimize that potential opportunity in the future. So just a few more of the variables that uh, we kind of put into the mix of uh, coming up with this particular recommendation. Thank you. Okay, so now now kind of to the, you know, the, the key part, which is, okay, what do we, you know, how do we put this all together and where do we go from here? Um, so first, uh, just kind of a continuation of, of that discussion. Um, it, you know, there's, there's obviously, uh, we, we, we've sort of joked uh, across the, um, uh, this effort in terms of the fact that there's so much flood risk, it kind of opens the door. There's a lot of different options and a lot of different ways to group these buildings and, um, you know, so it's, we're almost like we have too many options, but that's obviously better than not having them. Uh, so the kind of the two ways we'll present um, our way of thinking about grouping these is first, we kind of looked at these in terms of the areas and in terms of the, uh, whether they're residential versus commercial, because that has implications as far as um, uh, the different, uh, the different approaches and requirements through the, uh, through the federal funding options. Um, so the kind of the three areas that we, we've talked about, and I'll show another map here in a second with the, the same area, um, but there's the property south of the boulevard. Those are the, you know, the um, non-residential buildings, fairly expensive, but significant flood risk. Um, and then uh, properties with high flood risk north of the boulevard, uh, and then just kind of remaining buildings, uh, remaining buildings outside of the, those non-residential ones. So we're kind of grouping these into a few different categories with how we talk about these and how we've summed up kind of the, the different dollar amounts to give some perspective as to what we're talking about. Uh, but again, keep in mind, given the, the need to be flexible, given the voluntary nature of this, and just, you know, there's a, the fact that we're talking about this being a multi-year, you know, up to 10-year kind of effort to get all of this addressed. Uh, obviously, a lot of this is subject to change. Um, so those are kind of the three areas. And then, uh, as Doug mentioned, there's there's a number of buildings we've kind of put, at least for now, but it, we put in kind of the remain and manage flood risk. Um, so these are buildings, again, that we're not necessarily talking about including in this recommended buyout program, but uh, those are still buildings that will be there and you know th could pursue other options that don't necessarily require um, fe major federal grants you know, to, get, uh, to get additional things for their buildings. Um, to, to kind of reduce that flood risk in just a less, um, in a less, you know, comprehensive fashion, let's say. So that's, uh, that's how we've kind of thought through grouping these spatially. Um, you know, in, in our minds, it's like just, just taking pen to paper kind of thing. It, ideally, we would kind of group these together and those correlate to what you'll see in, a, in the next few slides here as we wrap up. Um, what you'll see is correlating to kind of the different funding programs that we are recommending. Um, but again, there's a need to be flexible given, uh, given the voluntary nature and that sort of thing. So again, we have the, um, you know, the, the main commercial buildings south of the boulevard there, additional um, commercial buildings north of the boulevard, and then um, the residential buildings that 
uh, mostly have expressed interest or we expect to uh, we expect to participate in this program over time. So that that leads us to all right. Where do we you know where do we go for that? We're talking pretty big dollar signs here. Um, there's an obvious need to leverage federal funds for these sort of things. Uh, so we explored a couple different options. Um, but FEMA is kind of the front runner. So Federal Emergency Management Agency. Um, they have a number of funding programs uh, for this, you know, for flooding issues and other ha natural hazards specifically. Uh, so we, we're kind of talking about throwing all of these at, uh, potentially all of these funding programs at this area, depending on the needs and depending on kind of the timing and that sort of thing. Um, so really quickly, just to, just to kind of give everyone an idea of what these entail or what they're typically used for. Um, there's uh, HMGP, which is the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program. That is run by the state, which is nice because it's not federally competitive. It's more dependent on the uh, state of Iowa's Emergency Management Agency and their priorities. We've already spoken with the state and they're aware of this issue. They're aware of this area. Um, and they seem to have, uh, we seem to have their support in prioritizing this as, as an issue and that um, that has funds available both in the short term and more than likely in the longer term to put towards this stuff. Uh, it's again, it's set at the state level. So it's, we're not talking about nationally competitive programs, which is desirable. Um, but there's only so much money to go around. So there, you know, there's the need to go outside of that. Uh, the next program down is called FMA. So flood mitigation assistance, uh, that is nationally competitive, but these sort of projects are right for FMA because there's a few repetitive loss properties and they handle quite a few, um, they've handled quite a few large buyouts and acquisition programs like this. Again, it's, you know, it, it's because it's nationally competitive, it's not a done deal, but you know, this area does have quite a significant flood risk. So that's, that's another option we're talking about uh, pursuing down the, um, pursuing, you know, over the course of this thing. There's another program called BRIC. It's fairly new. It's kind of the shiny new object in the mitigation world. Um, it's even more competitive, I would argue, than the FMA program. Uh, and there's, it's, it's only, this, uh, we're coming up on the third year of this uh, BRIC's existence. And it's kind of an ever-changing program. Um, at least the, la you know, the last couple of years, it's, it's evolved even just that over the last couple of years since it's been in effect. Um, that is an option for when we start talking about like ways to redevelop the land that's bought out. So uh, we mentioned like the stream remeander project and potential, you know, like environmental or nature-based approaches to either achieve additional flood risk or basically to repurpose the land. So that is an option, although that's, uh, you know, we're talking competitive federal programs. So those are by no means done deals, but they are in our, um, repertoire of, of programs. And, you know, we think there's a very strong case given the benefit cost results and given just the, the nature of this area and the flood risk. Um, so those are, those are the grant programs to get the overall projects funded. There's also what we'll mention um, is called advanced assistance or like project scoping. Um, that is money that can be requested to be put towards additional analysis and planning if it's needed. So you know, we've done a lot of what is needed for some of these grant programs just with this effort here. But if we're talking about a larger kind of stream remander project, that that's something that could be leveraged for that approach. Um, so I do want to, I did mention the HMGP. That's, it's almost the low hanging fruit. That's, um, it, it's because we kind of already, we've, we've already spoken with the state about this. They're aware of this area um, and have encouraged us to apply, you know, whenever, we are able to. Um, that's kind of the low hanging fruit to get to get the ball rolling and to get this really moving in terms of getting some federal money. Um, and then I do want to touch on the uh, the cost shares that are involved in these different programs. In general, um, in general, it's seventy five federal share, twenty five percent non federal share. But the state of Iowa um, is it, due to you know solid management of their funds and and. Um, capitalizing on these opportunities, they typically cover 10% of the, of the non-federal share. Uh, so we're talking for, uh, for, you know, the interests of Clive, um, 
we're talking in terms of just general planning purposes, we're assuming that any of these programs we're having to come up with 15% of any total project uh, proposed project values in terms of the local cost uh, cost share needed. However, that's not always the case. Sometimes it's, uh, I, I will point this out just because there is a recent, um, in, the, in the latest 2022, uh, I think it's called Consolidated Pro Appropriations Act from Congress, uh, they have dictated that these programs should, the federal cost share should be up to 90% uh, minimum and then 10% non-federal cost share. And the state of Iowa, again, said they would uh, plan to cover that 10%. It's not a done deal. But what that means for Clive is there's potentially no local cost share for some of these initial rounds of HMGP money, which is obviously great news. Uh, so that's not all completely solidified. It's That's a, a recent appropriations um, uh, bill back in March, just like a month ago. So it's taken some time to trickle through the system. But based on our conversation with the state, that is what we're expecting in terms of cost share and, um, and you know, just the different programs. So that's, that's the HMGP that's on the table for this year. Uh, there, you know, in future years, it's not, it's not a given that it's going to be exactly the same environment. I don't know that that 90-10 cost share would, uh, would stay the same there. But um, at least for now, that's, that's the case. And uh, you know, we just, down the road, it, it's still an option uh, to leverage that HMGP money, but, um, you know, it's, it, it, we're, it's, we're talking future years where uh, there's obviously potential changes to that sort of thing. So um, I'm probably being a little bit more long-winded than I intended, but uh, in addition to the FEMA funds, I mentioned um, FEMA is our, our primary uh, funding source at this point in, in terms of what we're recommending. Um, however, that does not mean that that's the only funding source out there. Uh, not going to go into these in detail, but basically the takeaway from this is that we've also explored a number of other potential funding programs. If for whatever reason we feel like it's, uh, we feel like the FEMA funding sources are not going to cover everything um, or like additional components to this, for instance, you know, the stream remeander piece. So that is, um, you know, in the final report that we're producing from this effort, we're kind of outlining these other options in terms of uh, in terms of potential funding sources, but you know there's obviously different criteria and that sort of thing. Um, however, FEMA is pretty. I, I will point out that FEMA is pretty uh, comprehensive in their grant programs in terms of what's required and that sort of thing, especially with some of the more competitive programs. So it's kind of like if we're headed for those or planning for those, we should be in good shape for any other um, directions that you know may may be taken in the future. Um, some other considerations, I think we hit on a few of these, but I do want to point out again the difference just between the residential uh, acquisitions versus the commercial. The commercial have a few more um, requirements, most notably the environmental and historic assessments or EHA um, that are required for commercial. Uh, so the, that kind of impacts the grant timelines. And for instance, um, when we're talking about the HMGP money, the low hanging fruit kind of for this year, we're not really considering doing commercial just because of kind of the extra steps that we have to go through there. But um, that's, that's more of like a timing and requirements kind of thing. But obviously for down the road um, in the coming years, that's, uh, that's, that's what we expect to uh, go through to get those uh, commercial buildings acquired. Um, I think with that, I'm going to hand it back to Doug to talk, uh, to kind of elaborate a little bit more on the different pots of money and throw a few more dollar signs up on the screen so you can kind of put you in, put it more in context of what to expect and kind of when. So Doug, I'll, I'll hand it back to you there. Great, thanks. So um, again, that's exactly where I'm going with this is how do we take all of that and make it specific to what we're trying to accomplish and how quickly can we accomplish it? Um, right now, as you all are aware, uh, you've kind of started allocating funds to this project. We've been using money for buyouts, uh, 14 properties acquired at this point. Uh, we have a little bit of money left over in the current phase three uh, pot of buyout um, that we're suggesting is again, kind of rolled into this bigger, broader program. Uh, we also at this point have uh, earmarked the uh, Recovery Act monies that the city has received um, it's about $2.6 million that can be allocated to this program. 
We also have uh, some other monies in our capital improvement plan that can be allocated to this. So right now we're talking about a, a, a war chest, if you will, to be able to accomplish some of these early term projects of about four to four and a half million dollars. Um, that's great because as you saw the bullet point above, you know, we're talking about $50 million of expenditures to accomplish this goal. Um, now, again, very large number, but as Jared had indicated, if we are able to do the right leverage with these other programs, and we're not talking about spending $50 million of the city of Clive's money, we're talking about spending 10 to 15% of that of local money. And certainly um, that secondary list of opportunities for funding and additionally, some other things that we've got in our minds. Um, our hope is that as we get into this thing and figure out how to grind on it, uh, we're talking about even less city of Clive cash skin having to go into this. But um, in, in terms of how we might move forward, uh, based on your conversation tonight, is there are two open declarations that have funding available. Uh, those, again, occur because a bad day is a, has occurred somewhere in the state of Iowa. So those two declarations are open in the state. Um, even though those bad days happen someplace other than Clive, it does give Clive the opportunity to make that request. Acquisitions in floodplains is uh, the highest ranking priority for the state. So even though one of these declarations is because of the derecho, uh, if the state feels uh, that they have available funding, uh, acquisitions would be applicable and we could take that money and do the project. So there are two currently open. Uh, if we move forward with the program, we solidify our communications with the property owners and in essence kind of get the uh, hand raising from those property owners. We see that there's an opportunity to pick off two, three, maybe four or five residential properties with those two current open declarations. And obviously we have the available matching monies to accomplish that. Um, the, the, again, not nice thing, but what is fortunate about these declarations in Iowa is we've had, uh, I think it's, 22 declarations in the last 20 years. So we're in essence averaging one federal presidential declaration per year in Iowa. So although these numbers are relatively small in terms of what's out there right now, every year there's a probability, a reasonable probability that there'll be another pot of money to go and make a request for. So again, it's going to be in this persistent, consistent cycle of grinding it out uh, for HMGP. The other, uh, other options that Jared had indicated, there are other programs that require some additional due diligence, but we do think that those are uh, available options on the near term. And Jared, if you'll hit the next slide. This is what we're really looking at is, again, uh, if you want to move forward, we would go after those HMGP monies right now. We get the hands raised from the property owners and we go and get that working. Um, more or less at about the same pace, uh, we would be working towards uh, making an FMA application by the end of the year. And this is where we would get into those first uh, commercial properties. Uh, in this case, we'd be looking for those properties that have had repetitive or severely repetitive flood damage in the past. That's what will score very well in this program. And we have a few properties that will fit into that category. Um, at the same time, we'd probably also be making an application for advanced assistance to further the analysis of the stream remeander project, uh, really proof up that concept, get to about a 30% design consideration level so that we can then make uh, what is illustrated as number four, the brick ask. And this can be done in conjunction with buyouts of those properties south of the boulevard, or it can be considered as its own separate standalone project uh, if, if, uh, if necessary. But that's really where we see that big step, those properties south of the boulevard, uh, making the big bite there, 
and then also again potentially getting the uh, funds to allow us to make the advancement once the prop once the buildings are gone what's the next evolution of the uh, the real estate and, and property and then number five again is just this annual reoccurrence of presidential declarations where we just every time we have the option one building here two buildings there and we just kind of grind on that every year that uh, set of actions, again, is kind of the bread and butter of the FEMA world. There are all those other programs, all the other options, uh, and some that aren't even on the list that uh, we know we may be able to go and chase with, uh, with other partners. So we do see, uh, although it is uh, an impressively large number for the city of Clive, $50 million, um, as we've kind of gone through it and analyzed it and, and figure it out, is it really realistic? I think the answer is yes. Um, so I'm gonna pause right there to just give you a second to uh, digest that. Uh, again, the big takeaway is if one, you decide you wanna move forward uh, with the buyout program, there are current near-term opportunities that we would need to get after immediately. And then secondarily, there are some uh, uh, future opportunities that are gonna require some due diligence that we would need to get after immediately. And then the other part of this, uh, again, uh, just can't be stressed enough is for any of this to be successful, it is requiring an absolute partnership and relationship with every one of those property owners. And it's going to be a matter of grinding with them to get this accomplished. Uh, so the amount of time and effort that we're going to have to put into uh, building that relationship and, and really getting to a point where the property owner and the city are just kind of working hand in hand to get this accomplished is really going to be the, uh, the, the primary means of success. We think we have the technical means to do it. We think we have the financial uh, abilities, um, but that part is going to take a lot of effort to, to get accomplished. So again, I'll take a pause at that point so if you have any questions, and then we'll finish up with uh, a couple of if we get past this, what's the future look like? Eric? Doug, we've been working on this for five, seven years, I and mean, we identified it a long time ago as a priority for this council. So I, I'm encouraged by the direction and, and the, you know, the ability to, to go outside of the box and look at a wide variety of different funding right there. One of the concerns I have is the ability of, of some of the property owners that, that, that wanna play ball with us, right? That, that wanna take the offer, that see the opportunity, and in the environment right now, you know, it's it's hard for them to say, I want to sell because I can't find anything of this value. And Ted can probably attest to that from a real estate perspective. So while if, I certainly think I, I like I like the plan, I'm concerned about that. The other thing is some of the large commercial buyouts right there as well, too, um, with some of our partners, uh, business partners, you know, are they, are they, we've talked to them about it. Mm -hmm. Are they willing to go along in a partnership? Are they willing to relocate? Are they willing to sell? This is, these are big moves for, for big companies right there. And I understand it's a long-term program. It's not going to happen tomorrow. Um, but those are a couple of concerns. I do like the way that we're able to capitalize on a lot of this, you know, FEMA opportunities and, and the various funding levels right there. Um, how, how much have we invested right now in the city? Um, the city's money, we're just under $2.5 million invested to this point. You've got, what, 15 properties, some of that nature? Uh, four, 14 properties have been acquired. So we're, we're moving on, on the right path right there. And when we started talking about this, we all understood, look, this is a big lift. It's a long-term lift. It's, you know, it's a big problem. We're not going to solve it tomorrow. You know, I, 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 like, I like the ability to just continue to grind away mm -hmm. uh, without any you know, just continue to make, make substantial progress on, on a regular basis. And I think my response in terms of uh, principally the large commercial property owners, this again is all predicated on them coming to the realization, them, their choice, right. coming to the realization that the flood risk is more than they want to manage. If, if they feel like they can manage the flood risk or they want to wait it out or, or you know, take their chances, that's their choice. 
Um, there is nothing that we are suggesting that says you have to go. What we are suggesting is we want to be in a position that when you've come to that realization that the flood risk is too much, we want to be there at the right time with the right tools and the right resources to help them get to a better place. Yeah, but that's think, the message. That is we continue working through this and continue to present data like this with flood modeling. Look, they know this right now, but as we continue to present this to them, continue to make progress and they're seeing, hey, City of Clive is serious about this. We continue to acquire flood prone properties. I think that'll probably be easier down the road. Where, where I'm having a hard time wrapping my mind around is you're right on the commercial side. It's very complicated, right? And so how do we sync up their, um, you know, awareness and, and willingness to our garnering of the funding? Mm -hmm. How do we sync that at the same time to make it work? I, I haven't been able to figure that. So. Yeah. So again, that is really that last point that I made, which is an absolute commitment to building a relationship. Um, we know these programs take a lot of lead time. We also know that uh, then there's a period of performance. So once we're issued a grant, we have to execute within about 36 months. So, you know, we are talking about three or four years, you know, from a point of somebody raising their hand and saying, I have an interest. Okay. City of Clive will go chase a grant. It gets awarded. Then we've got that three year period to actually pull the trigger and do the acquisition and the demolition. We're not actually doing the FMA right out of the gate. Then we're waiting until we get the commercial property owners to say, aha, I get it. I'm ready to move now. So absolutely. Any of these things, um, again, if the city council is moving forward with the program, my very next step is reaching back out to every one of those property owners and saying council's committed to resolving this problem through the acquisition of properties. Uh, the council is committed to putting resources behind the program to chase the grants, make the matches, things of this nature. Uh, who's ready? And who's ready in the next three years period, basically? Because I need that group of people to then go and chase you know, all of these things down. If we don't have hands go up, obviously that's an indication that we need to rethink uh, kind of the whole approach here. But again, if you folks are, are given the direction that we're ready to move forward over the next 30 days, that's my next effort is reaching out and seeing how many hands uh, truly are being raised. I, I have a sense based on the work we've done to this point that we have a number of folks that have reached that point of realization. Um, but, you know, now it's a little more real. Again, this isn't a binding decision. So it is a hand raise. Yes, I'm interested. Yes, I'm willing to go through the process to see if we can get the grant. There's still no hard decision until you actually sign over the, the property. And that could be three or four years from now. And Doug, given, uh, given what you just said, um, is there still a projected <laughs> short, like a, a best case scenario timeline versus a, a worst case scenario timeline? Like, you know, if it, if it takes a lot of work to get some of the property owners on board versus if they all just kind of raise their hand all at once. Because um, I'm, I'm really thinking like that grant round number four, that's a, you know, that's a big part of the, of the local share as well, as well as for the overall project. Um, I'm just thinking, is there a thought process on one that might come to fruition? Yes. So um, I think there may be one property south of the boulevard that uh, may have a very short term interest. Uh, so we may use one of those, you know, the number one or the number two funding to, to solve that problem. Um, I think, again, if we are moving forward, I would like to go after the third item, if get the uh, advanced assistance to allow us to build up the case for the south of the boulevard. That's gonna take a year to do that. So the rest of those properties south of the boulevard have another year of discussion and engagement and thoughts and what ifs and all of that. 
um, and we get to a point of saying, okay, we've got a great case around the environmental stream remander benefits. We, we know that the acquisitions are positively benefited in terms of the cost benefit ratio. So we know we have a good solid project. We're still back at that. Okay, there's less, there's remaining property owner south of the boulevard. Is your hand up or not? And it'd be a decision point. If they're not, great, that's fine. We have everything ready when they are ready to make that decision. Uh, if they are ready, then obviously we go and make the ask and, and then pull the trigger. And that's about, again, another, you know, one year of preparation and then a, another three to four year window of execution. So again, none of this is going to happen overnight. Um, this is all going to have to be fluid, flexible on our side, flexible on property owner side. But it is just a matter of making that decision. Are we doing this or not? And then we'll get to work building those relationships and finding out how do we grind this thing out over hopefully 10 years or less. Yes, Eric. Doug, you know, one of those disaster declarations expires in June, right around the corner, the other one at the end of the year. How does that affect our ability to lobby for the funding project through the Fed or through FEMA? Um, right now, uh, the one that is likely or one that is closing in June is likely to get extended to September. Uh, but September is just around the corner. December is right around the corner. If you all want to move forward, uh, staff has built a, a, a case around the work plan to get that accomplished. Okay. Uh, we do think that those are low hanging fruit. They're, they're ready to go for us. And I think we have residential property owners that are ready to raise their hands. So I do think that that is an area of opportunity we don't wanna miss, again, presuming that you all are ready to move forward. Um, the other ones, again, kind of come and go and we take them as they, they come in terms of opportunities. But if you wanna get going, we would chase those monies right now and then we'd start working on these other things immediately after. Do you see other disaster declarations next year or the following years? I mean, who knows, right? I mean, I can't predict what Mother Nature is going to bring to us. I can just simply look at the history and say we're averaging one or two of these disaster declarations in Iowa a year. So the probability is that there are going to be more of these types of, of uh, projects for us to chase. Michael? Couple, uh, couple things, clarification on it. You know, some time ago, several years ago, we released some city money to these homeowners on deductibles, wasn't it? If I remember right, to cover some of the deductible for their flood damage. We, we had a donation that was made to the city of Clive and the choice uh, for the utilization of that donation was to help those people that had suffered the worst from the 18 floods. Okay. Uh, so so it helped him. It set by city money. No, it was a donated dollar. Correct. Okay. okay. And then the the brick grant is it fair to say you kind of have one chance at it? Meaning, if you get one, there's not going after brick for two different shots, or you know, I mean, yeah. we may have a significant number ready now to go brick this year and then go after the bigger ones in the future, right? I'm, I'm worried we have $4 million sitting around now. And when it's time to pull the trigger on the big ones, we don't have $4 million anymore because it's been spent on all the little ones. And I think we've all agreed here that South there is pivotal to make this whole thing change, right? Without it, you don't get your landscape as we need it. Um, and so, and I agree, the owners have to decide, right? So I guess back to the question, is brick a one-time deal? So, so my answer to this is brick has only been around two years. Third year. uh, so the idea of can you get more than one, don't know yet. Yeah. I would presume that if you had a qualifying project, and again, um, BRIC is a nationally competitive uh, program. East Coast, West Coast took 
all of the money oh, in the first brick application. The second one is under review right now. It's a billion dollars, right? I mean, it's a lot of money. I suspect it's going to get sprinkled beyond East and West Coast, uh, but it is a nationally competitive. The other thing with brick is brick is not going to be a source for a simple, again, simple property acquisition program. It, they are looking for projects that are creating a catalyst for your community, that are using nature-based solutions in terms of the outputs. Um, it's got to be more than just acquisition. So when we talk about that brick opportunity there, that's really where we're suggesting partnering it with the stream remander, ties to the green belt, uh, obviously gives us the opportunity to create and, and Jared, maybe, can you go to the next one, please? So you're saying if that petroleum company really cared, they step up to the table and want to move voluntarily to put nature back. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll propose it to them. Thank you. Let's see what they say. But, but this is really, this is, this is the scale of what is necessary for that brick application. It has to be something more than just an acquisition. And this is just an image of, of again, part of the district one planning process of where we said, uh, we're, we're done fighting mother nature. We need to find a, a future that is in essence, retreating from the floodplain. And just as importantly, once you get past that notion of managing that flood risk, if you're gonna go through all of this effort, spend all of these monies, you better get something out of it other than just losing 27 or $30 million of tax base. So in our minds, uh, again, because of our uh, uniqueness of, in terms of its adjacency to the green belt and to this greater vision of, of a, a, a reinvigorated east side of our community, we do see that this is a, a really interesting opportunity to connect that nature-based solution, the environmental benefits, the recreational benefits as a means to catalyze some of this redevelopment in this area. So if we can put all of those things together, we do think that, at, at least from our viewpoint, we think we have a, a reasonably competitive case to be made. Uh, but it's going to be in that context. It's not going to be just about buying out properties. Santex on the phone, so they should, re they should take notice that HDR you see here has donated some land. Or, uh, on here. <laughs> and Santec should probably kind of see down here HDR in the corners. Uh, Santec should take note, but yes, no, I, I agree. And th those conversations after I was wanting them to be prepared to go, you know, do a brick this year, but I get it that we've got to have willing participants, and so yes. we probably just need to step up uh, the discussions with some of the major. Ted, just real quick. A couple of things. So just so I'm clear, high level numbers, we're looking at $50 million total. 10% for Clive contribution puts us at about 5 million. We have four to four and a half in the war chest right now. So again, just to be clear, are you saying you don't see a whole lot of general fund uh, requirements going forward? Yeah, I, I think, um, again, just as you've alluded to, we're pretty close based on what we have now. Uh, we do have at this moment, uh, what was identified in the last capital improvement plan that you approved a $500,000 annually uh, from, the comp, uh, from the CIP. So, you know, if you just abstract that out and say, if we were able to do that over 10 years, $5 million of, of funding there, plus uh, what we have available at this point, again, in my mind, you probably have the ingredients. Now, again, we have to have partners, but right. I think you have the ingredients to get this accomplished. Okay. There is one restriction there though, with the ARPA money in terms of how that piece has to be expended by a certain date. Yes. Uh, so there's some constraints on some of those dollars. Well, that is, of them have some sort of constraint. Yeah, right? I mean, constraints. they all got ties. Yeah. That, that one is a, a time related constraint. Yeah. It needs to be obligated. The 2.6 needs to be obligated by uh, 2024 and expended by 2026. Hmm. Uh, so it does play into, you know, some of the strategy that had, would have to be aligned to uh, make sure that we got that done. But again, um, I think we're all smart enough to 
figure, figure out, out yeah. how to make so that happen. Last question on the HMGP, you got three to five properties listed and a total cost of 3 million. I mean, even if we go five properties, that's $600,000 a property. I thought, are those not residential properties? Because uh, the, these are the be, HMGP. Yeah, these, uh, if we were to go after that, those would be residential properties and they're costing us a, you know, somewhere on the order of, of uh, w when you throw in all the cost and demolition and all of that jazz, uh, those homes over there, roughly about $250,000 a piece. So we should really be able to do more like 10. You, you can. Um, we were also, again, we're, we're um, those two de disaster declarations have limited monies. There are only about 2.5 million available. Mm -hmm. um, I think it would be unlikely that the state is going to allow the city of Clive to take all of that. So that's 2.5 for the entire state, not correct. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, something in that range, okay. you know, again, we might be able to get one, two, three, maybe four or five if we're really lucky, but. Uh, I like your thinking, Weaver. Yeah. I mean, make it all. It. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Go big. Your Honor. One thing too that I want to, and it goes back to the last, one of the last pieces that Doug mentioned uh, related to capacity. So this, because I just want to make sure the council was eyes are wide open on this in terms of the staff capacity and commitment side. To do this right, as Doug mentioned a number of times, it's going to take grinding and staying on top of these grant programs. And as you know, with federal grant programs, there is a ton of uh, things that you have to do, boxes you have to check to get it right. <coughs> secure the funding and then and then follow up on the funding so if if the council you know this has been discussed as a high priority for many years know that if we're going down this path which it sounds like is where where the council wants to go that this is this is again a significant commitment of staff time particularly doug and others to grind this out and that could inhibit some other things in the short term in particular, as we try to really get our feet underneath us with these property owners and aligning with these federal programs. So I, I say that now just to know that it isn't just a financial capacity question, it is also an organizational capacity question. So what's the opportunity cost then? The potential. Yeah, the potential. opportunity cost is, uh, um, and I'll say it for Doug's benefit, when we, we get into strategic planning, most of the top and high priorities on the council's list are related to items that community development has to focus on that list may need to look different for the next couple of years so and there may be opportunities we have to pass on for example uh, the zone uh, one redevelopment i would say i would say district one um with that being one of your top priorities i think that is the balancing act that doug and i've been talking about is that keeping that but there might be opportunities like uh, things that we've talked about here of um, infrastructure changes for certain area redevelopment areas of the community outside of district one. What we're basically saying is if we're committing to this and then the things you're gonna talk about for the next two months around district one is we're committing most of our staff capacity to that square mile, whether it's the flood buyout area or implementation of district one. Now, those have been your top priorities for a while just know that there might be opportunities that present themselves that we're going to have to maybe figure out a different way to do it if it's still a high priority for the council. It's just a conversation that we're going to need to have, particularly this year, because um, this is going to consume a lot of his team's time and other, you know, and it's going to spill over into other departments, particularly when we talk about what might be the end result, the stream remander, that's basically a park. We're basically extending in park areas infrastructure with public work. So just, I just want to make sure, I think, I, you know, I think we've been working on this long enough and this is, it, this is, uh, Doug and I, as we've talked about this, we didn't know if we would ever get to a point where this is actually achievable. I think what you're seeing tonight is it's achievable. Um, of course, there's a lot of things that have to fall into place. Um, but then we're also understanding to make it achievable, it's going to require, you know, that dedication to it. And, and so I, um, just want that to all be in our minds as we look through, you know, those priorities may, may be a smaller number and very intense for the next, you know, 18 to 24 months. And then if we're successful, you know, then maybe things start to fall into place. Now, if we don't find property owner participation, that changes things. That might, that might mean that we're grinding on smaller pieces of this 
you know, especially if some of those bigger commercial properties, you know, have, uh, have challenges, you know, in terms of getting there, in terms of the, 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 the buyouts, um, the residential properties could still be, you know, picked away over time, but that's, so that could change the game. But I think that's just something I want to make sure that we're all on the same page about, um, again, a lot of opportunity here. Um, but then it, yes, there is that opportunity cost for other things that may come in the short term. And I don't know what all of those are today. Cause of course, some of these things we don't control that come at us and, and some things that we have to deal with, of course, development is going to continue and we're getting close to our build out out West, but just know that it's, you know, we're going to have to do a lot of balancing with that. If, you know, we're grinding on this at the same time. Well, I can certainly understand, you know, staff only has so much bandwidth. So, you know, the ability to be flexible and nimble and reassess our priorities is going to be key to this. In addition to building those partnerships with mm -hmm. Participants, you could just uh, withdraw Doug's vacation time for the next couple of years. Done, <laughs> good. Make up for it. Right. Approved. Then we would have other problems. Um, <laughs> and I think another piece to this too. I know Doug's kind of hinted at it a little bit with the stream remander. There's there's regional opportunities here. There's regional benefits, particularly to our neighbor downstream. And so that also could present an opportunity to help us with things like brick applications score better if there is a, a regional benefit. You think we can get that cooperation <laughs> from other communities that realizing this regional benefit? I, I'd answer that by saying that um, we, we've been working very closely with Windsor Heights. Uh, they share- I'm not labeling anybody. <laughs> they, and I, I just wanna, again, be on the record. When, Windsor Heights uh, gave us the modeling that allowed us to advance this project as quickly as, as we did. They, they did a similar type of project uh, and were gracious enough to let us leverage that uh, with no cost. Uh, we have been in conversation with them continually. They have flood risks that they're trying to deal with and manage. Um, there are opportunities in our minds that uh, we can share some resources potentially. Uh, certainly share some of the technical information, but we do think that there'd be an opportunity as we talk about things like BRIC or some of these other bigger programs where some of the projects that we are talking about may have, they're not, they're not going to, again, solve their problems, but there may be enough incremental benefit to warrant them participating with us. So we do think that those are opportunities. Okay. And one last thing I can add, Jared, if you'd go to the next slide is this is a game changer for this neighborhood too with what you're seeing on the screen. So as we talk about the district one plan, again, you're gonna be talking about it for the next probably three council meetings. And this is gonna be a piece of that. You know, if, if this community is able to realize that, you know, even a, a substantial portion, not, not even all of it, a good portion of what you see on the screen, that's huge for this neighborhood in terms of potentially replacing value that, we would lose through a, through a buyout program, creating the park space that we know that that neighborhood is generally under parked, creates a, 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 just a really awesome connection to the green belt, which is another challenging thing that we've had for this neighborhood. I mean, this is really a game changer. So I think even though there's gonna be a lot of grinding, I think the, the, the potential for the end result could be really, really cool for this community. And also, you know, also a model, I think for the region to see how you can do this in an existing kind of neighborhood that was really put at a disadvantage from the beginning just with how it developed before flood maps existed and turning it into an asset like this, which I know we've talked a lot about, Pete's talked a lot about on the water resources master plan is how do you turn what some may view as a, you know, a detriment or stormwater or something you wanna get rid of into an amenity. This is an example of how you turn it into a, a, a jewel of an amenity for the community. Right, so and for this neighborhood in particular. Yeah, they go hand in hand. Really, right. it, it really brings an interesting context to the whole District 1 plan. It's... Mm -hmm. and what, 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 sorry, go ahead. Nope, you're up. Uh, I, I was just going to ask, do, does the idea under the BRIC plans and some of those larger funding sources, does that include money to redevelop it the way this is kind of you know envisioned here? Or is it something less than that? So I would say that the... Uh, FEMA monies, whether or not it's HMGP, FMA, BRIC, whatever it is, really isn't going to uh, provide a source for the, the development side of it. 
it's a source for managing risk, the hazard. It's a source for uh, restoring that open space or that natural floodplain function. Uh, but there would be a number of other tools, another whole suite of uh, funding sources that we'd want to go tap into that are more related to park and recreation, for example, or uh, trail or uh, utilities, water, sewer, uh, things of that nature, or water quality. Um, you're going to, again, if you're going to realize this type of output, what we're talking about in terms of FEMA and the buyouts and this stuff is step one, step one of many steps. Um, yes, go ahead. Didn't mean to cut you off, go ahead. No, no, I'm done. Um, I, I was just gonna add, so is there the potential here then if we, if this is kind of like the phases that you were talking about, right? Like we start with a few of those three or four properties under the HMG uh, program. Um, is there potential to seek funding to do that development side as well to give to give some of the maybe the if there are a few property owners that are hesitant or you know not necessarily sure that they want to go through with this it would give them an idea of what this space would look like yes i i do think that uh, it will be very important to create some early wins um, beyond just the acquisition so uh, I know that we've talked quite a bit and talked about it as strategic planning, uh, working with the Parks Department. We want to find those ways to activate the spaces that we have acquired to this point. We've, we've got a lot of acres over there that are just sitting vacant. Uh, can we find ways to put that into production for the residents right now? Might not be, you know, a, a super swell playground, but can we create some ball fields? Can we create a gathering space? Can we play, put a place for people to put up a volleyball net, things of that nature? Can we do those things immediately? And then as we obtain more properties, as we consolidate and get larger blocks or groups of properties, uh, there may be those opportunities to create some of those smaller, incremental, more early wins to provide that next kind of level or, or proof of concept to the redevelopment piece. Um, Again, I get really excited about that aspect of it, but I have to temper it by there's a tremendous amount of work that would have to be done on the things we're talking about before we get to that point of, of uh, talking about redevelopment. But, but absolutely, I think the potential is there. We know we need early wins. And I think the commitment uh, that you, you'll see from the staff is to really figure out ways to, to get that activation as quickly as possible. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, and I'll just add, you know, we were just talking about vacant lots used for food trucks, so. <laughs> yeah. Food trucks, movie nights, ball games. I mean, there, there's an infinite number of opportunities that, again, with a little imagination and doesn't have to be expensive, we can we can get out there and, and give, uh, give the community something to be hopeful for. Michael? When you've modeled this, or Stantec, when you've modeled this, do you take in consideration the current railroad, the sovereign nation uh, with that bridge and what it does if they don't do anything, right? Yeah. So, you know, I would hate to find out that the investment, then we find out, well, we really need the railroad because they won't do anything. And, and I can give you the, the 30 second version and then the Stantec guys can give you the technical version if you'd like. Technical, but, I need your 30 second. Okay. Um, <laughs> One of the alternatives was in terms of the modeling, is there an alternative that says, let's rebuild the railroad bridge and make it big enough that we can pass all the flood through and reduce the flood risk in this neighborhood? That was the question. That was the, the hypothesis. Uh, they ran the model. We pretended that the bridge didn't exist, if you will, that we were able to make it big enough, which we probably wouldn't be able to do anyway, but we wanted to see and see what would happen. It does reduce flood risk, but it doesn't resolve flood risk. So even at some point in the future, if the railroad goes away, for example, that no longer needed and the bridge goes away, you still have a significant flood risk in this neighborhood. Okay. And if it goes away, you've transferred more flood risk downstream to 
our partners yeah. because we're going to be let But regardless you can do what's on the screen with or without a change to the current yeah. model of train yes yeah, so everything that we you know once we finish with that alternative analysis everything else is based on the idea that the railroad bridge stays there forever and so what, my last question is, you know, I like the idea of those quick wins and you see those areas now that, you know, you've, you've demoed the houses and to, just in green space. I think we're still taking care of the property, which I agree with for now, but we need to figure out a, putting that money back in. The other property I think we do own now is the piece that's on the outside of that dotted line towards the oil wells, right? Or the oil uh, tanks that strip from, yeah, we own that now, correct? Correct. So we could do something like that today to say, I mean, that's an access spot for the trail. It gives you a little bit of flood retention or stormwater retention. Yes, yeah, so there's certainly opportunities. Uh, we own that little strip that has the little trail access as well as the ground that has the native upland title on it. All of that ground is, is uh, currently under the city of Clive. Again, in my mind, uh, again, if we're moving forward and we start doing that advanced assistance to figure out the stream remander, the disconnection or daylighting potentially of that big storm sewer that comes through that leg would be part of that consideration. And you know, as that project would be proofed out a little bit, same concept would go through in my mind is, although it's a big project requiring lots of big moves are there there's incremental things that we can start doing now even if we don't get the brick thing can we go and do this piece of it or that piece of it uh, but right now i would say you know you don't want to send me out there with a backhoe and start digging things up we just you don't have a enough giant excavator <laughs> huge we're a million dollar excavator <laughs> So I think you've got consensus here, Doug. What else do you have to show us? Today? Um, nothing more to show. I just want to recap and make sure that I do understand uh, what your desired direction is, uh, either head nods or thumbs or something of that nature, if we're on the right track. If you are to a point where you feel comfortable with the recommendation that's being presented to you, which is a large scale buyout for this uh, neighborhood. If that is the case, then again, we will go to work in uh, finalizing the document, bringing that back to you for approval. Also authorizing the uh, city manager as you've done with the previous programs to begin the process of uh, property acquisitions. We'll also be uh, providing recommend our resolutions authorizing the issuance of uh, grant applications and setting the stage for those next uh, moves that we would make over the next 12 to 18 months. So, um, if all of that makes sense to you, I do understand what I need to do next, but if there is something that I'm missing or if you have other guidance, I'd be happy to take it at this point. Srikant, uh, we can't really see your head nodding one way or the other. So do you want to weigh in? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm in alignment with, uh, with what it's proposing and Stantec is proposing. Very good, thank you. So I think we've got consensus here. Very good, thank you much. Stan Tech team. Yeah, thank you for having us, Sarah. Mr. Mayor, though, I need to at least say this. Uh, you, you have Not to. in, right. But to Ted's point, I don't want this movement to deter us from focusing on Lenan, right? That was a done deal by this council years ago. We're moving forward. There's not going to be any more oh, wait, oh, let's see what down south looks like. Let's build south first and get a feel if we do need Lenan, whatever. We're all laser focused on Lenan and, okay. And that's part of that. That's a key component of that district. I think that's fair, totally fair. Like, absolutely. Yep. And the councils, we have the capital funds in there identified and committed for Lenan. Thank you. All right. I think the next item we have is reports. Pete, we'll start down on your end. Thank you, Your Honor. As a segue, I think you've all started to see the communications about the grand opening with Harbach Center, which is, of course, right there next to Lenan. On the 5th, we'll be celebrating formally the opening of the new space and also celebrating with our friends Cinco de Mayo. 
tons of fun things ha happening. Uh, the neighborhood all did get postcards, but we'll getting them either to tomorrow or the next day. They were sent out today telling folks about the new facility and about the uh, upcoming celebration. So we're expecting a great turnout. And of course, we'll have our council meeting there that evening as well. The survey, resident survey is on the street uh, starting April 20th. Folks were able to start filling that out who were in the randomly selected households. So we get the good statistically significant information. On May 25th, moment. Yep, on May 25th through June 8th, the survey will be open online to any Clive resident who wants to fill it out who hasn't already. So we'll continue to promote that. It is one of the features in the mayor's newsletter that's going out with the uh, May utility bills. This week, we've been very busy out on Clark Street. If you haven't driven down the street, um, first off, you can't get through if you're coming from 114th right now because we're all torn up in that next portion of phase two. So we'll, work is underway. But if you work your way around to the east a little bit and come back down and drive up the corridor, you'll start to see these, some really beautiful trees that have been planted now. Uh, the parks team did a great job and some of the students from Apex program, Waukee, came in and helped us out getting those trees planted. We also have some that are still on hand and we're gonna see if we can't get those already cited and placed in the portion of phase two that was completed last year and won't be disturbed again by the construction we've got going on right now. So we can take advantage of the, the good pricing we had on those trees and get them in the grounds so we don't have to keep worrying about dealing with them back at the park shop. But great sorry, job. About, do you do, I'm sorry, you still, you need help doing that still? No, no, okay. the, the first round of trees where we could get them planted went in and now we're gonna go ahead and move forward with planting in the other area now because we have a few extra trees still on hand that we can but utilize. But you have people that can, okay. Yep. The other big project on Clark Street right now though is stabilizing the area. After multiple years of construction and a, sea, and a pretty rough uh, winter for the places that had been stabilized last year, we've got a lot of places with the bare soils, soils that are eroding a little bit because some of the hydro seeding didn't take as well as we'd hoped over the course of the winter. <coughs> All of this is incumb it's incumbent on us now to make sure we get out there and stabilize that area. But we have heard from some residents who are concerned about that, but we are formulating a plan, me, Jeff, Richard, numbers of number of folks from the parks team and the public works team walked every single inch of that again this week. We've been out there consistently since the construction season started. And now we are form formalizing that plan so that we can get out there and get things stabilized to start with. The work that we still have in front of us then is going to be to complete the plantings that go in those cells. And Jim Hagley and his team are working on that bidding document. We've had some bad luck, but the first few times we put it out there, but we think this next time around, now that the trees aren't in it, we've got some good feedback from potential contractors that we'll get the bids we need so that we can move forward with those plantings. Should that not work, we'll keep problem solving, right? If we don't can't find a partner outside of uh, outside the company, we'll look to getting these things done in other ways as well. But if you do have constituents who reach out to you on this issue, please don't hesitate to direct them to me. Uh, and we, again, we're working quickly to make sure we can start sharing plans and details and answers with those folks who've been putting up with a lot of construction for a long time. We appreciate their patience. Uh, finally, uh, Metronet was busy in my yard this week. They are just finishing up some of the remaining little spots they had over in the 124th Street Lincoln area so from our neighborhood councilman. But most of their activity is still focused in the, in the country club neighborhood. And after I touched base with Jared, our right away manager this uh, earlier this week, he says that those teams have been doing a pretty good job. We haven't been hearing a lot of complaints from constituents and families, but this is still just the beginning. So in an effort to get residents more and more information, we're gonna do another blitz of information about what Metronet is doing, put the information out there so residents know where to go if they've got an issue or have questions, and certainly put ourselves out there as that extra backstop to get people accurate information and help them get issues resolved if they come up. Is Metronet still being proactive and putting information out? They've uh, fallen off that track is wow. what Jared and I have found out. Now people are getting mailers now about the services being available, but the <laughs> door hangers aren't happening. The yard no. lawn darts aren't happening. The things that they represented that they would do when they first came and pitched this um, for, for various reasons, it doesn't appear that they're able to continue to do that. Could be shortage of hands to do it, or it could just be that they're off track with getting around to all the different neighborhoods the way they thought they might. So just a quick note on that, Pete. So I, I'm still waiting for them to bury the cable in my yard. And I reached out to them and they had said they had a long list of folks who are following up on, but 
um, as you know, as I indicated, they they said they would get out there, you know. So perhaps we just need to give them that extra mm -hmm. extra notification. Yep. They they move quickly when they get to your spot, but they also have a big backlog of restoration work that comes with that fast movement and all the stuff that they had to get uh, tuned up after after the winter months. <clears throat> Anything else, Pete? Just a thanks to Jared and the Public Works team for dealing very, very proactively with MetroNet. Uh, Jared's done a, a really strong job make, holding them accountable, even to the point of getting down to sort of brass taxing some of the crews that had been working before and made mistakes in Clive. They just don't get to work in Clive anymore. So he's been a really vigilant manager in that space. He's done a nice job. Very good. Shrikant. Thanks, Mayor. Um, only thing I have to report on tonight is that I'm continuing to work with Matt to get up to speed on everything going on. Um, so I just want to take a, a quick moment to thank Matt and all of the city staff that are taking time to meet with me and you know get me up to speed and, and tell me what I need to know. So I appreciate that very much. Thanks. Ted. <clears throat> Nothing the night, Mayor. Eric. Yeah, Mayor. Um, I attended the Clive Historical Society fundraiser along with Councilman Judkins. They did a a great job there. It was uh, they had some great prizes. Hopefully, they raised some some nice money. Um, so, uh, best of luck to those folks right there. Um, also, had the CVB meeting today, and it was held at uh, the public safety facility. I just want to report that everyone was very uh, very impressed with this facility. I want to say a special thanks to Chief Rowe and Chief Vanima for uh, giving some great tours. Uh, I think all of them just had no no idea of what really goes into all the technical uh, side of the house when you're building a, a police and fire station right there. So they're very, very impressed with the capabilities that we have here and, and how nice it was. So uh, everyone that really enjoyed that. A little bit on CVB, uh, Hotel Moto has very much rebounded. As a matter of fact, they're 145% of budget. So that's great. We're seeing a lot more uh, heads and beds uh, as you've seen uh, a lot more events right there. Um, I'll be putting something out that gives you an idea, but the new tour was was uh, renewed for next year. They're looking, uh, the Iron Man will be this year, and they're looking at a three-year extension of the Iron Man. So these are multi-million dollar uh, uh, return on investment for the greater Des Moines area right here. A lot of really big, big projects right there. Uh, in addition, they've uh, the, the number of impressions from the digital campaign, and they've won a number of awards. Uh, in addition, uh, uh, so they just changed to a new uh, ad agency, uh, Flynn Wright, which is a little more uh, digitally focused, much more digitally focused. So you're seeing more of that. I'd like to play a video for everybody. Pete, if you'll run that, this will be running. Jeez, you got like props and everything. <laughs> <laughs> and I, Council, we're going to do our best here with the sound, but I might get a little feedback with the mics here. Sure. How do we follow? <laughs> So let's start that from the beginning, Pete, would you? Yeah. Um. Councilman, we've run into this. One moment. Maybe we can play the sound over like my phone or see if I can get it queued. No, I've got it queued up. The problem I'm running into is that I'm going to get everybody reverb if I play the audio on this one. Uh, so like this. Turn our mics off or anything? Mute the mics. Uh, we can try muting the mics. It might uh, silence everything for everybody who's. Oh, they uh, won't hear on, your machine. Well, everybody, we'll, we'll give it a shot. Let's go ahead and mute the mics here. Yeah, mute the mics. Watching yeah, online. Take a minute, it's a 30 second video. It's really cool the animation. This is one of the. Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, the animation was done by, we were able to get in on this early, uh, but it's really taken off. You'll notice that the speaker of this is the one that did, uh, uh, he's never done this before. Uh, he did one of the, that with the Isisarets, one that we did uh, previously as well. So got a really distinctive voice and it's, it's just really cool. So you're seeing this uh, enhanced digital campaign that, that is very effective and it shows by the awards and the number of impressions as well. So uh, things going very well. That your Flynn, right? That one? Uh, they okay. just signed the Flynn right, so it is not. This is uh, done internally that we contracted out. That's Anything all else, Eric? Nope. Thanks. Uh, Pete mentioned the newsletter. Uh, in today's email, you should have gotten an advanced copy of the newsletter. And we're going to try to do that going forward to make sure you get it in advance. I think there have been times, at least for me anyway, uh, that someone's asked me about something in the newsletter and I haven't actually seen it yet. So we're trying to put it out in your hands a little bit early. So going forward, we'll be doing that. If it's not in your boxes today, certainly first thing tomorrow. Yeah. Okay, um, Michael. I do not have anything tonight. Council. Nothing tonight. Yeah. Just a couple items, Your Honor. Of course, just a reminder, tomorrow morning is the Employee Appreciation Breakfast starting at 8 a.m. at the uh, Clive Public Safety Center. We'll be in the Apparatus Bay. So uh, uh, have uh, tables and chairs set up in there and uh, have the breakfast, uh, similar cater we've used in the past and some uh, uh, presentation of awards, similar to what we've done in past years. So we're kind of in this mode now. We're doing it in the spring, trying to stay away from the winter and the snowstorms that we've run into to make sure all the staff can be there. So really uh, looking uh, forward to having all the staff together and, and do those recognitions uh, uh, tomorrow. So just a reminder for that. What time do you want us there, Matt? Um, I would say 22, quarter two at minimum would be great. And we'll make sure the doors are unlocked so you can get in. <laughs> um, so the, that'll be tomorrow. Um, also, just a reminder too, on the DC trip coming up, uh, a number of us will be there. Some of the things that we talked about tonight particularly related to these federal programs are gonna be uh, talking points for our federal delegation and how can we partner up. And I think even what we talked about a little bit at the last council meeting of uh, using our federal partners to look for ways to get exemptions or, or considerations for exemptions like in the CRS program and what we're trying to work through in terms of that unique Clive exemption that Doug talked about. These are all conversations that are gonna be good to have with our federal delegation and, and, and looking to partner with us and uh, other opportunities that we might have going forward. Because again, we're gonna be looking at a lot of federal funding opportunities. We wanna make sure our delegation's right along there with us uh, on the D, at the DC trip. That'll be an ongoing conversation and for multiple years um, with your action here tonight. Uh, a reminder too on uh, the Economic Vitality Committee. Again, if you've got some folks that you wanted to send a personal invitation to, please be sure to do that. Uh, we're, we'll still be taking those uh, applications into next week. And then my hope is, is before the end of next week is to get the mayor uh, and council member Jedkins uh, kind of the list of what we've got at this point. And the three of us will then get together and start to go through that list. And then hopefully by the end of May or first of June, give a, a recommendation or the mayor make a recommendation to all of you on the first appointments for that committee. And then lastly, just to follow up on Councilmember Klein's comment related to the Historical Society and their fundraiser, uh, the mayor and I and Councilmember Jedkins uh, met with, uh, and uh, Richard Brown met with a number of uh, the board members, a couple of board members last Friday, just in terms of where they're at as an organization. And so here in the short term, um, the city's gonna do make some additional efforts to come alongside them and help uh, promote uh, board member participation also thinking about the Harbach Center and what are some things that we can do from a joint programming perspective or speakers or things that we can bring in to highlight the historical society. I think there's a need for that. And it's something that we'll talk about with the council a little bit more when you see the District 1 neighborhood plan because they, as an organization, are identified in some implementation aspects. So I think what's going to be really important for the council to consider is how are we supporting if, if we're going to be asking that organization to partner with us on a number of things, I think there's gonna to need to be some capacity building going forward for them. And so what are some ways that we can do that and make some commitments there? Um, so, and also thinking broader beyond just the, the this history storytelling telling that happens related to the Swanson House and the railroad era. How can we you know, start to tell different uh, layers of history that Clive has experienced? Again, you talk, we talked about one tonight pretty extensively related to flooding and the green belt. You know, how can we expand the palette a little bit of, of the historical society and what we think of Clive's history? So 
more to come on that, um, but staff's already been kind of chewing on it a little bit. So that's all I have, Your Honor. <laughs> Matt, could we look at dates and maybe find one when we're all here and do a new council picture? Oh, yeah. You can do, definitely do that. Anything else for the yeah. good? Yes. Matt, quick question. Mm -hmm. I noticed on the bill that the Dallas County Auditor sent uh, sent us a, a bill for special election for four thousand eighty two dollars and sixty one cents to the citizens of Clive. Have we received a, a bill from uh, Polk County for the special election? And if we and how much money have we spent on legal fees for the special election? I don't think we've gotten one from Polk County yet. And we and other than what I reported last time, nothing additional. How much was that? I'd have to go back and look at the email. I'll, I'll, keep, I'll put that, I'll update that tomorrow. I'd you like know, to see a running count of that. Yep. How much the taxpayers are being yep. asked to pay for this. Thank you. Anything else for the good of the order this evening? Seeing none, we'll adjourn at 756.